Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone is safe and taking care during these uncertain times. My name is Varun Gaba from the Scat India Show, organized by Nunberg Messe India, and would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you attending our webinar today on the future of satellite and cable TV in India. Let's get right to it and introduce our panelists for today. Starting with Mr. Dev Chand Haria, Managing Director of OptiLink Networks Private Limited and Channel Master Private Limited. Mr. Haria has played an important role in educating cable operators on fiber technology and fiber products and has worked on projects of digital cable head end and integration for about 500 channels and solutions for digital distribution. He will be joined by Mr. Jignesh Mehta, founder, founder of Mehta Infocom Private Limited, founded by him in 1990. Mr. Mehta leads the Mehta Group by planning, developing, and implementing ambitious business strategies along with evaluating the company's financial operational sales and marketing structures to plan for constant improvements and operating efficiencies. Next, we would like to introduce Mr. N.K. Roos, Chief Operating Officer of Indusind Media and Communication Limited, the flagship media business model of the Global Hinduja Group. He is an industry veteran in the media space of pay distribution with 33 diverse experience of which 25 years of experience in the broadcasting and the cable TV pay business. Joining them is Mr. Sudeep Malhotra, founder of the Satellite and Cable TV magazine and the Scat India show. Mr. Malhotra brings to the table 36 plus years of experience in the satellite and the cable TV industry in India. He's also the founder and promoter for the Satellite Media Group with the interest in publishing, events, satellite television, program production, and syndication. Rounding up our panel today is Mr. Vyash Maleshwar, CTO of Invas Technologies, having 28 years of experience in optical communication and data network networks field test and measuring equipment. Mr. Maleshwar has obtained more than 29 product approvals from DOT, which is considered as one of the great technological achievements in the Indian telecom industry. Moderating the session today for us is Mr. Manoj Madhavan, editor of the Satellite and Cable TV magazine, a leading magazine for the cable, satellite, broadband, and the IPTV industry. Manoj Madhavan is a media professional with over 25 years of experience in the exhibition and the publishing industry. Before I hand over to Mr. To Mr. Madhavan, just one note to all our attendees. We will have a Q&A session at the end. So please send in your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Manoj, the screen is all yours. A very good evening to all speakers and delegates. It's, it's indeed a pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for the first panel discussion organized by SCAT India and the Satellite and Cable TV magazine and Nuremberg Messe. So with, without wasting much time, I would just start my panel session with a brief introduction on how the cable industry has progressed in India. The cable industry was established in the early 80s, to be precise, in 1982. And at that time, there was only one channel that was Doordarshan channel. But surely and slowly, the industry has today grown to over 1,000 MSOs and more than 75,000 local cable operators, supporting over 900 television channels. And we have the cable operators reaching around 120 million households across the length and breadth of India. The last couple of years has seen some consolidation in the cable business with Reliance having acquired Den and Hathaway, two of the biggest cable companies. But 2020 was something which hit the entire cable and satellite industry with something which nobody had ever dreamed, dreamt of. That was the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to start the session with the first point of the agenda, that is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the satellite and cable TV industry. And I would like to first address this point to Mr. Maleshwar to start the session on how he has seen the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the satellite and cable TV industry. Mr. Maleshwar, if you could start the proceedings, sir. Yeah, uh, good afternoon all. Uh, I'm Maleshwar. I'm CTO of Inverse Technologies. 
thank you very much for the organizers and uh, panel members and it is pleasure to be having this session today so yes uh, your question is a uh, very uh, right time and right uh, question to us and also to the cable tv industry to know the, what we have impact already and what we are going to be affected by this uh, session or uh, what covid 19 the covid 19 has disrupted the entire lives of the world in fact all the people are affected about uh, with this covid 19 so when we say that, uh, I will say in the four points, the four points are affected here. The complete ecosystem is affected. Complete ecosystem means the supply, supply material chain, and also new project implementation, and also the workforce that are currently working are also not, not up to the mark right now. But still, some people went off to their homes and all they returned back, they're not returned back due to they went to long distances. So they could not come back and work again. So this manpower shortage, supply material uh, chain that is affected and ecosystem also affected and also the imports and also uh, also affected and transport distances uh, whatever and all that is there are also affected very much i'm very saying that industry is now suffering with su supply chain materials and also implementation part due to the less manpower so how we work overcome from the coming days it's very very important to how we are going to change the scenarios and all that it's not in our hand the situation has to improve as it's uh, by course of time, but I'm very confident that this industry being an in essential services and very confident that this is going to be uh, the strongest backbone for Indian uh, scenarios. And also when the CATB is, is collaborated with the broadband provisions also nowadays, so we'll improve the situation. So hope that we, we come out of this problem COVID-19 very strongly. So as your question is saying that at the four points, it is really affected ecosystem, supply chain, new implementations are affected, and reduced manpower is also affected. So we need to take care of them in a systematic way and come out of this problem at the earliest. Hope that my other panel members can give better uh, answer for this also. Uh, I would like to now address it to Mr. Devchand. Mr. Devchand, uh, what, how do you see the effect of this pandemic on the satellite business? Hi, good afternoon all. Good afternoon to my fellow panel members. Good afternoon to all the participants. As yeah, Mr. Maleshwar said, the whole of the ecosystem has been affected. And this COVID-95 has affected all type of businesses, all sectors have been affected, being small or the large. Now, when we concentrate on the cable industry, cable industry felt into the essential service. Now, once the COVID struck and the lockdown was announced, I think all, all people had to be at home. And the major source of entertainment was cable. So when we look at the cable TV industry during the COVID times, the requirement for the connections and connectivities increased a lot. Actually, there was a, a surge of uh, requirements and cable operators had a good uh, requirements for the set-top boxes and the new connectivities at that moment of time. But since the whole ecosystem was affected and uh, they did not have the hardware and the manpower could not work because they were not allowed to go to the buildings or houses, they could not take uh, advantage of the whole situation to get the more connectivities or expand their systems. So overall, they could manage some uh, positive things when the COVID started and the lockdown has started. Now, since we are in the opening of phases and we are seeing the hardware availability is going up, the connectivity is requirements going up, this is the time when the cable operators or the networks can take to expand their network. And uh, it has actually given a positive boost. Just before the COVID, when we see the economic, it was quite slow, it was slowing down. But this has actually given a boost to the cable industry. And I think once uh, the ecosystem is put in place and things go better, uh, cable industry will be the first industry to come out of this uh, economic uh, slowdown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Devchand, for your insight. Uh, Mr. Jignesh Mehta, I would like to have your comments, sir on how you foresee the impact of the COVID-19 on the cable business. So your audio is mute. Yeah, fine. Good afternoon to my panel, panelist friends and uh, uh, the viewers also. Uh, see, the, busy, the, the challenge which has happened, uh, which is very much uh, unforeseen and uh, which was never thought by anybody. And uh, 
this has affected the whole world. So our industry is a part of, uh, is a very small portion of it. But fortunately, the whole world is affected. Almost all the nations and the economy is affected. Cable TV has just mentioned uh, that we are, cable TV and broadband is, we are, we are in, the, uh, in the frame of these essential services. So fortunately, we were slightly in a better condition apart from the many other industries. So uh, I would rather say that there was a surge in, may not be in cable, but there was a very big surge in data consumption during these days. Because apart from your uh, online platform of uh, Netflix or Hotstar or n number of other uh, OTT platforms, the people, many people, well, uh, the, uh, which was viable, many people work from home. There is WFH concept was very much popular and it was enabled. So there was a very, uh, this was a very, there was a very good surge of data consumption during this period. And as I mentioned in the, about that June magazine issue also, that uh, uh, essential services is the first sir, roti aayegi. Now it is a bread and butter. After that, kapda makan nahi, parantu hamari industry, ya the pharma ya the healthcare ke baad mein, immediately then we are coming. That is entertainment and broadband. So coincidentally, it was much, uh, uh, it was comparatively somewhat better and comfortable time for our people. So the, uh, we cannot change the situation, in fact. But uh, fortunately, and again, coincidentally, we are in a better shape than the other, industry, than the other industries. And due to this uh, digital platform, so the collection that is, uh, uh, fortunately, because of this uh, digital rollout of this uh, uh, CATV industry some few years back, so the collection was almost online. There was no physical going uh, of the people, which was not allowed as per the, as per the nomenclature. So uh, it was much, much better condition for our people also for cable TV people and uh, ISPs, both. I'm done. Okay, I, thank you, thank you very much, sir, for your insight. Uh, I would request the delegates to put in their questions in the Q&A box. After we end the panel discussion, we will have 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A session. So coming to the next point, uh, the NTO 2.0 implementation and its impact. The implementation of the new tariff order and the broadcasting framework mandated by the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India was one of the biggest changes in the history of satellite television in India. It allowed consumers to select and pay only for the channels they want to watch, but this has run into a lot of litigation challenged by the broadcasters. I would like to invite Mr. Roos, your views, followed by Mr. Sudeep Malhotra, who will also give his comments. Uh, starting with you, Mr. Roos, can you please give your input, sir? Yeah, good evening, uh, everybody on the panel, and good evening to all our listeners. And I'm sure a lot of my business partners and cable operator friends might have joined to listen to this webinar. So I would like to thank SCAT for arranging this webinar. When we talk about NTO 1.0, uh, the first of the NTO 1.0, when it was launched somewhere in the month of December 2019, and then implemented in the year February 2019. We saw a huge or, or a steep fall in the subscriber base. Close to 25 to 30% of the subscriber base had fallen. There was uh, the multiple TV connections going off, then there were English channel viewers moving off, then there was financially uh, vacant, vacant people who were moving off to, uh, to the uh, Doordarshan Direct. So we saw a lot of movement towards uh, OTT. We saw a spike in Fredish. We also saw some people getting into some sort of uh, you know minimum guarantee deals thereby 25 to 30 percent there was a fall in the subscriber base in during the NTU one there was a lot of who are created during those times and broadcasters also said that they, we have lost big time revenues uh, close to thousand odd crores they say they have uh, lost out but then it's gradually it started stabilizing but over a period of one year time the authority felt the consumer didn't get the proper right of choice, which was expected from the NQ 1.0. Multi TV got disconnected, as I said, and consumers not happy with the 100 channel offering at 130 rupees. 
the one of the reason for ntu 1.0 was to uh, was to get uh, that non discriminatory uh, part of it that also was uh, uh, it didn't happen actually over a period of time there was a lot of uh, com complaints coming from consumers from various stakeholders complaints on ntu 1.0 so this all things put together there was a thought process by uh, the by, by the authority that they should look into the flaws and try to correct it there was this broadcast of bouquet pricing all of a sudden there was uh, hugely discounted and uh, given as but the a la carte prices were very high uh, carriage fees also was one concern by some broadcasters so the authority found so much of uh, flaws in the in the in, in the uh, ntu 1.0 they they came up with the new uh, uh, amendment called ntu 2.0 now the ntu 2.0 immediately uh, it was uh, uh, discussed uh, with the stakeholders and most of the stakeholders actually uh, and the entire stakeholders to, went to court uh, there are a lot of issues uh, as per the stakeholders but the authority also has their point of view uh, they have tried to correct the uh, you know ntu 1.0 which was the flaws were there in that the possible impact of uh, ntu 2.0 would much will depend as what the broadcasters will actually do if the broadcasters are planning to you know bring the price down uh, uh, to a 12 rupees or to a less than 12 rupees because now there is a lot of limitations in the ntu 2.0 the bouquet price uh, has been uh, you know has been put under a condition called twin condition okay so thereby the price max can go only up to 12 rupees Uh, if they want to be, if the broadcaster can want to keep the bouquet, uh, the channels in the particular bouquet, the max price can go only up to twelve rupees. And if they want to price anything, there 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 is no price control on the channels. In case if they want to price it beyond twelve rupees, they can keep outside the bouquet and charge nineteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, hundred, whatever they want to, they can do it. But the, there is a uh, uh, there is an issue. The broadcasters uh, are not happy about it. Uh, it looks like the one impact could be if they if if the broadcasters if they bring the price down to a twelve rupees or so, there could be a possible revenues will come down for every stakeholder. Uh, the consumer will be definitely will be happy about it, but the uh, there will be a cost which will, there will be a revenue which will come down. That's point number one. Point number two, the there could be a there could be a possible uh, niche channels and uh, weaker channels. They might go FTA if the broadcasters are not able to hold on. They might discuss or they may decide to go on a FTA mode. That also can impact our revenues. Then there had been a, 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 a you know the NCF has been brought down. The carriage fees has been brought down. Even for multi TV homes, uh, uh, the NCF discount going up to sixty percent. This all will definitely uh, you know result in the revenues going down. But I'm looking at the positive side of NTU 2.0. Definitely, uh, there we also it saw that during NTU 1.0, there was a fall in subscriber base. Now this could be the uh, the best time for uh, for the cable fraternity to bring that subscriber back uh, when uh, when NTU 2.0 is implemented. The the multi with the uh, multi TV home uh, you know discounting and with the uh, with the uh, costing of channels coming down. Uh, we have a very good chance of bringing these subscribers. What what we lost during NTU 1.0, we can bring them back. So I see a positive side of it, and I am very sure that the uh, uh, the authority as well as the other stakeholders will come together and implement uh, NTU 2.0. Though from March 1st it has been implemented, uh, some of the uh, uh, you know issues are still to be resolved. So I'm looking forward for the positive side of NTU 2.0. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Uh, Mr. Malotra, uh, as somebody who has been tracking the business for the last 30 years, how what is your take, sir, on this? Hi to all the panelists and everyone else who's watching. Manoj, you kind of all you guys scare me when you point out my 35 or 32 years of experience in this industry. I start to feel very old, almost as old as a white hair in my beard. My thoughts on the NTO, frankly, are pretty much radical and have been. and i've expressed them through the pages of the magazine in the past also in the first place i don't see why it is the business of the government of india to regulate at what price i should sell my product having said that nto1 was a total disaster why tri decided to implement nto1 only in part and not in full 
went through several court cases and several years of delay and after that decided you know to wave off that cap of 15 percent uh, maximum discount on bouquets and so on i guess only they know that was a disaster ntio 2 i think improves on that a little bit uh, however having said that the rus if i could point out for the broadcasters they do have an option to price their channel at more than 12 rupees they can price their channel at 100 rupees if they want but then they cannot package it with other channels it has to be offered only as an ala carte which i think is good because if i have a sports channel or a golf channel which i think is you know the best in the world and i want more money for that there's nothing stopping me as a broadcaster from pricing it at 60 rupees a month or 100 rupees a month and if you're an avid sports fan or an avid golfer you will subscribe to it a la carte whether you get the numbers to justify the existence and survival of your channel or not time will tell market forces will tell and as a broadcaster i would then have to keep tweaking my price to reach the optimum that the market can take and the maximum number of subscribers i can get at that having said that coming round to you know uh, questions that are asked about uh, the second tv in the house or uh, should an ncf be charged for the second tv or should it be capped how many channels should be the maximum and so on i think the nto2 is pretty clear on all of that what remains to be done however is for the industry within itself without involvement of the government to decide how the ncf is going to be shared between the mso and the last mile operator for the lmo that ncf becomes his bread and butter for the mso they have got different sources of income like carriage fees advertising they've got their own uh, cable channels and so on and so forth that is an internal issue that is still a little ticklish still needs to be tackled and i'm waiting to see uh, what kind of moves the mso alliance makes towards that uh, i am not very hopeful for that going in favor of the small cable operator because these guys are not organized at all so i think there would have to be a sense of fair play internally between all the msos when they are dealing under this nto2 with how to share the booty with the last mile operators thanks thank you thank you mr malhotra that was a very insightful another radical transformation proposed by trai was the stb interoperability is it going to be a non starter or will it be implemented how do all of you look at this development i would like to first address this to mr roos yeah uh, a tough one stb interoperability it's a, going to be a very tough one yeah we all started digital and when we launched our set of boxes the basis or the foundation of the set of box software was that in none it should not be interoperable none of my competitor or none of my dth or any other db should not be able to operate my set of boxes okay now what we are talking about is having the same box to be uh, should be operatable by the rest of my uh, you know competition or whether it is Uh, dth or dps but there had been some lot of uh, thinking going now uh, because it's there is lot of challenges to uh, come out come with a set of box which is interoperable uh, with the with, with other systems and with other conditional access systems and everything when we talk about a set of box the set of box has got so many features uh, when we when we when we go and when we uh, you know sit with the uh, with the vendor there is there there is an aspect of content security there is a piracy matter there is a fingerprinting required there are so many aspects to the set of boxes which i don't know whether we can standardize that and everybody to have a standard head end uh, it's a very tough one uh, if uh, now there's some thinking that ki the interoperable should be happening will happen within the dth and for cable it will be within the cable fraternity but to come with the set of box which has got a usb and with a download downloadable cas uh, a, a very uh, a tough one a very challenging one i'm not saying it is impossible technically yes we have solutions for every problem we have, there is a solution uh, technically it is available and it is possible but is it viable and is it the right time to get into it can we not have a timeline uh, by which we there is a standard you know uh, uh, specs for everybody 
uh, uh, the the CAS and the libraries for it because the, the CAS and libraries are actually hard coded or flashed at the set top box manufacturing level. So the current set top boxes, if whatever we try to do a, a download is not possible. Uh, so there is a lot of challenges into it. I'm sure JRI has got a, a lot of in, uh, you know, uh, uh, insight into it. They have lately started working very closely with uh, with us and with uh, TTH and we, we have been trying to, uh, you know, do some test uh, operations with them. My view would be uh, there has to be a lot of tests, uh, you know, on, on the ground should happen. Uh, a proper proof of concept should be uh, made. And then thereby we should get into with the timeline, maybe uh, five years down the line. This is the way forward and this is the boxes which we should import or manufacture or made in India, make in India. And that, that's how the, it should move forward. Otherwise, I, I, I think it's a very, very financial risky proposition as of now, if you ask me. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Roos. Uh, Mr. Devchand, uh, what is your thought on this? You're, you're on mute, Mr. Devchand. You need to unmute. Yeah, TRI has been uh, discussing these issues or uh, recommending the interoperability, I think, since the last four to five years. And I think we have uh, already deployed more than millions of boxes already on the field. And uh, now is the stage, even in April, now the TRI recommends that uh, it is something similar to a mobile phone. They want, like in the mobile, we can change the SIM and uh, take any... Uh, uh, telecom, uh, sub, uh, this we can just select the telecom providers. They want a similar way. Even the boxes can take care and uh, can select it to any of the cable MSOs or the cable agents. And the reasons that they are giving, like they say that uh, this is currently the customer uh, is not able to change the service providers easily. It hinders the technical innovations. And if we can have an interoperability, they will have an overall uh, good uh, sector growth and good uh, improvement in service quality. I think none of, none of these points gets addressed when they ask for an interoperable set-top box. If we check the current uh, situation, as Mr. Roos said, even the current set-top box, they, everybody has a conditional access system. And conditional access system can be a soft CAS, it can be a hard CAS based on the smart cards. Each will have a own security features which will either bind to the chipset and to make a set-up box to be used by only one of the MSOs or that particular uh, MSO or uh, head and holder who owns the box. Today, all the MSOs, they subsidize the box and they sell it, to, they give it to the end user knowingly that this box will only be used in their own head ends. It will not be used in the other head end. Tomorrow, if the box is made interoperable, it means then they will have to charge for the whole box because tomorrow the same box can be used by the other head end also. That will increase the cost of the box and here the customer will have to buy the whole box. And overall, as the technical things, if we see the cost of the common interface, basically if they want to go for a interoperable box, we'll have to introduce the common interface and common interface cost box would be huge, which will uh, uh, have a huge uh, payment for the end customers. And even the once the interoperability is done, then the questions will arise of the GUI because today every MSO will have their own GUI. They will have their own softwares. The scanning of the box and the, the EPGs and everything is dependent on the MSO software. Tomorrow they will have to try and make it all systematic as per the common interface boxes or to load the new softwares on the boxes, which will make a huge investment even on the head end part, not just on the box part. It will be a huge head end, it will be a huge investment even on the head end part for the MSOs and the cable networks or even for the DTH networks. So overall the, the cost of boxes, cost of the head ends, everything is going to increase. Even the service qualities and security will maybe compromised if interoperable is uh, done. So it doesn't look like a win-win situation. It's more of a losing situation for all the stakeholders in the industry. So I don't suggest, or I don't see any uh, thing how it will move forward or how it can go towards the implementation as all the stakeholders will definitely uh, oppose this move as it's going to add to the cost, doesn't add to the innovation part or doesn't add to the service quality part. 
and overall it's going to be even a bad cost to the customers and users uh, mr malhotra what do you think about this do you think this is something which the industry can afford uh, you know at the risk of making an enemy out of ruse i would say that you know this whole problem has come about you know if you recall when the whole cable act was passed and we went into digitalization that act the law that was passed mandated interoperability it mandated it it did not say in future it did not say maybe it mandated and said that all stbs have to be interoperable we ignored it all the msos ignored it all the dpos ignored it the dts platforms ignored it and the regulator ignored it and that is why we are today where we are had that been implemented from day 1 every single box coming into this country and 100% of them were imported mainly from china 100% of them would have had a cam module all they had to do was manufacture a box that takes a cam module module with a card supplied by the cable operator or the broadcaster and start using it from day 1 we didn't do it the msos didn't do it the dts platforms didn't do it tri turned a blind eye and no one pointed a finger at anyone that they were going against the law which is why we are here today let's come back to the practical aspect of it is it possible rus's suggestion i think is very valid that you know with all the expenses that have been incurred uh, with all the other expenses that we see forthcoming it may not be possible to do it now there should be a timeline and i should say rus that you know Uh, i would not define boxes as interoperable but more interusable in the sense that if you have an xyz cas on your box and are using it on your network obviously no other network should be allowed to take that same box with the same xyz cas and be able to use it and operate it themselves they would have to replace the cas or the card or the cam so they are interusable which gives the consumer really the true freedom of choice that if he doesn't like his cable operator he shifts takes his box and goes to the next cable operator and just takes a cam and a card module from the next cable operator and starts using the box there having said that again the second fault of the dth platforms and the msos is that most msos and dth platforms do not sell the box if you look at the wording on their agreements they are renting the box to the customer but a rental means that when the customer is tired of you he should be able to give it back which has never happened i have not seen a single mso taking back a box not seeing a single dts platform taking back a box and refunding the amount to the customer doesn't happen number 3 the timeline that rus suggests i think that's very valid let us be practical let bygones be bygones what happened what was supposed to happen we didn't do it but i think yes a timeline needs to be put in place the TRI and government immediately need to clamp down and say no more new boxes unless they have a cam module installable in them number 1 and give a timeline and say we are in 2020 say by 2025 all boxes have to be changed and should be you know with the cam module but effective immediately no new import of boxes without cam modules no manufacturing of boxes and no mso or dts platform will use boxes unless it has a cam module which allows the customer to then shift service providers if they are not happy with the current one lastly and i think this is where the electronics industry has to come into play it is i think very very essential and necessary that the government talk to the television manufacturers that all new tv sets have to compulsorily have two sets of tuners one for satellite and one for the normal cable frequencies with a cam module built into the tv set itself which would basically mean that when a customer buys a television set he can either take a dth connection because it's got a satellite tuner uh, fixed in he can take a cable connection if he wants a cable tv connection and all he needs to do is a, get a cam module from whoever the service provider is whether dth or cable and that would put an end in the long term when i say long term 5 years 10 years to 15 years to the problem of interusability of boxes it will just end that problem so two things number one stop all manufacture of boxes unless they have cam modules number two all boxes to be changed 
by let's say 2025 or whatever date the industry mutually agrees to and number three talk to the television manufacturers and have these boxes or the electronics with the cam slots installed in the tv sets themselves i think these three things will take care of this problem of everyone saying that interoperable we are spending money on boxes and so on and so forth and benefit the consumer which is what tras job is supposed to be on the other hand, i should also point out you know, coming back to one thing i should also point out while we were talking about second boxes and second connections i should say i have beaten that problem without spending a single rupee the way to do this is that if you have a set top box let's say a cable box in your drawing room and you have a tv set in your drawing room and your bedroom and you want to watch different channels in both places or the same channel in both places same channel in both places is very easy you do a parallel connection you don't even need a second box but let us say if i'm watching in my hall and i want to go now to my bedroom and lie in bed and watch the same movie without having to come down by come come back to the drawing room to switch off the box it's a very simple solution i just unplug the box and take it to my bedroom i've got two tvs with one box <laughs> Thank you, Good thank up. you, Mr. Uh, Malhotra. Uh, Manoj, yeah. Manoj, I I just want to add uh, since Sudeep yes, just has uh, given some good insight to it. Sudeep ji, see, see, so many challenges are there when we talk about interoperable. The we the the uh, the subscriber should know who are the pan uh, you know uh, uh, pan India operating uh, DPO and the DPO uh, the the sub even the subscriber even if he is a DTA subscriber, the directions of the you know dishes would be so. Different, so different from uh, a Tata Sky and from a uh, from a uh, maybe a Dish TV. So there are so many other challenges. Currently, till the time we and uh, the financially the uh, risk is so much high in this sort of a project. Rather than that, till the time we have, uh, we, as I said, there should be a timeline. And in and in till that time, we can definitely, if a subscriber wants to move, we can work out a model. Where the subscriber doesn't pay for the set-top box, then we continue with right of use, so that the customer is not hurt. Unlike in mobile, mobile people are buying seventy thousand, eighty thousand mobiles, uh, nothing less than five thousand rupees. Nobody buys. Whereas the set-top box, plain vanilla set-top boxes are hardly seven hundred uh, or eight hundred bucks today. So should we be spending so much money on a project, and we don't know where the set-top box, uh, uh, the science is moving to? Uh, it's already we are uh, talking about hybrid, and we don't know from hybrid it may move to a, a virtual reality sort of a set of box, and we don't know what will AI bring in to our lives. So we have to consider all these things, and with the proper timelines, we move uh, ahead of uh, interoperable. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Roos. Uh, I would yes, yes, Mr. Manotra, you would like to. Uh, just just a quick one on this rules uh, yes if one dth if if a customer who is subscribing to dth provider a wants to shift to dth provider b because he's not happy with the service or he's not happy with the pricing he's still doing it except that now he's going out there and buying a brand new box and spending that much more money being interoperable he still has to turn his dish or install a new dish or point his dish at the other satellite that is all still happening so i don't take the argument that is going to be difficult for him to point the dish or do this or do that he has to do all that anyway the question over here is to give the customer the choice the whole reason digitization was brought in was to give the customer choice whether it's with a la carte pricing whether it's with number of channels choice of channels and so on and so forth all of which i don't see as i don't think has happened at all uh, whether nto1 nto2 uh interoperability i don't think has happened at all the customer or the consumer is the guy who's lost out the most because of bad governance more than anything else interesting uh, insight mr malhotra let's see if we can see the light of this recommendation by try coming to another critical aspect manpower training and improving skill sets the catv community is short of trained and skilled manpower and The CATV started in metros, then proliferated to the cities, urbanized, rural, and rural segment in a centrifugal pattern. There is a huge void in capital resourcing, and technical skills remain one of the main infirmities in the cable TV industry. How does the industry address these issues, uh, Mr. Maleshwar? I would like you to give your insights on this. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Manoj. So uh, I'd like to. Uh, it's a very sensitive point, actually, when we say the skilled manpower. So most of the CATV, uh, the field people who are so, not specially trained or not certified, uh, 
and they are by low in education qualification and also uh, they have standards are not known to them actually, as yet so there's a large gap between uh, between actual standards implementation and also the, the skilled manpower and organization getting benefit out of the skilled manpower okay so most of the companies are catv small small companies and all that always sees that okay i should manage with my existing manpower a little bit trying uh, by time or they find a local guru over there and they try to get train people over there and try to move forward but in the long run it is going to affect a larger uh, parameter way so i clearly explain you the two parameters major two parameters which are affect the first one is that because of lack of knowledge and lack of standards not availability they may miss a big gap between the competition to their existing number one number two the so whatever the money they are investing the whatever and all that they may lose money because of the non skill person is operated on that so it's a two way loss actually so i strongly believe that the catv has to go with the standards implementations should know that what standards are available currently and how should go forward if they don't do that then there's a big gap is going to be uh, come up very soon and one more thing i suggest uh, the catv to go in a three level way what is the three level way the level 1 level 2 level 3 the level 1 who are all the field and ground staff they need to be properly trained they need to be educated what is the standards especially the physical line standards and all that what need to be maintained once the physical line is standards are there and it is very clear that you are going to get a good quality it's something like a creating a highway for your for your customer actually catv has implementing the fiber they have really taken a good advantage on the same speed they can go up to 100g the fiber can carry up to 100g level the phenomenal power the power that what catv is not at known to it actually because so tomorrow they are ready in fact to beat the competition to beat the speeds and also go for an any change of network component which will enable them to go to the higher level but who will guide them who know to the standards and how we can beat the competition suppose tomorrow from the fiber it goes to the wireless and how is going to happen so all this means they have to continuously improve the manpower and their skills there are various uh, uh, courses available even government skill india programs are there but the government skill india program is very lengthy one it's about one and a half months to two months course it is really giving a big gap and no one can invest time and also money because they are very low paid and all that so once that is a big problem then there is a big gap so for that i recommend all the cdv association all to come up with a region uh, region wise local language wise some training institutes so where they can take industry support and provide the training to the local local existing staff and also bring the new people into the line so that cover up the gap that's what my suggestion from our side and also investing the right manpower they save the money from that and also they don't lose the money that what they invested for the components and all that because wrong operational whatever and all the stuff and the management uh, also get, feel feels that okay they are getting money out of the investing the right manpower training and all that so i believe strongly that manpower training is very essential to all the organizations of uh, different departments of catv should come one forward and make a platform and have a standards placed in it and they should be ready for the region wise for example like in a bengal for example like in andhra pradesh telangana and local languages like kerala and all the people still they can have different different wings and trying the local uh, existing staff and also trying to the newcomers so that way it grows up in a in, in a big way and also comes up in a, uh, a standards based and also meets the international level of uh, competition i hope that other panel member can also comment maybe to there thank you thank you mr maleshwar uh, mr sudeep uh, briefly if you could given your points to this uh, critical yeah I'll be, i'll be quick about this you know this is a topic that has been discussed and debated uh, several times in the past two decades unfortunately uh, not much has come about it even though there have been some moves that have been made by various institutions uh, to set up facilities uh, to impart training and knowledge you know a formal theoretical and practical training and knowledge having said that i should say i'm i'm really proud to be part of an industry where for the last 30 years Uh, without any formal training every single person who are cable operators today have worked with their hands have gained knowledge on the field uh, through their work experience and are today experts and are able to sit across or sit shoulder to shoulder with people who are trained engineers and telecom engineers and so on and discuss technologies 
uh, headed equipment and so on and so forth with them. Uh, in the past, there was a move by a certain private companies to kind of fill in the gap and uh, train, uh, let's say, freshers or new cable network or technicians to uh, repair, run, operate, maintain cable networks. But I think that was uh, to a limited extent with limited resources and was maybe in some cases also biased towards selling their own products and publicizing uh, their own products manufactured by them. Uh, there was, of course, a move about a uh, year and a half or two years ago uh, by, uh, I think, the Electronic Still Skills Council for India, uh, which was part of the National Skill Development uh, Corporation, uh, to set up courses for cable operators. Uh, I don't think that made much headway. Uh, unfortunately, A, I think because of probably lack of funds for publicity or lack of knowledge, uh, imparted or disseminated to people from the industry that you can come and do this. Number three, most of these were long distance training courses. Uh, what we sorely require and we lack is like a six month or a one year comprehensive course that will lead to, let us say, a diploma in cable technology or telecommunications technology uh, with the, uh, should I say, involvement of the DPOs. Uh, primarily DTH platforms and the cable networks or MSOs saying that, yes, whoever's trained there has a certificate from there, we will hire them uh, in preference over others who don't. I think that is lacking and I'm, I'm sure some someone needs to do something. I saw a question pop up over there. Can SCAT do something about this or assist in setting up these kind of things? Believe me, we have approached the government several times in the past to provide facilities or provide some basic infrastructure where we can take this forward. Uh, not too many seem to be interested. But yes, I agree, something needs to be done. It's, it's going to get desperate in years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malhotra. Thank you very much for your insight. Coming to the next point, uh, digital India movement and proliferation of fiber infrastructure has picked up over the years. And Mr. Mehta is a key player in terms of the fiber infrastructure, I understand. Uh, Mr. Mehta, I would like to invite your comments and thoughts on this. You're on mute, uh, Mr. Mehta. Uh, dear friends, again, uh, when we are talking for fiber infrastructure, see, uh, basically CATV MSOs or ISPs are having uh, you can say very shallow type of any in a very small uh, radius or small diameter of a city or interconnected city networks of their own. They have necessarily to be dependent on the NLD routes of the telcos of the telcos, or uh, it could be Geo, it could be VIL, it could be Airtel, it could be BSNL, or it could be Airtel. So uh, last time when we were discussing, it was uh, told that we have a very deepest fiber network to the last mile customer. See, a cable guy or an ISP guy, like any other, any other person can enter comparatively very easily to any society, any complex, any colonies, etc. cetera. So uh, due to, uh, due to uh, the tenure of more than two or two and a half decade or three decades of services to these people, so fiber infrastructure of these telcos accumulated all these major four telcos, what I have given the names, is more than seven lakh kilometers all across India, but I'm not counting BSNL and MTNL. If you count like that, it is more than 10 lakh kilometers all across India. So keeping this perspective in mind, this either larger MSO or any MSO or ISP has to be more dependent on this type of uh, fiber infra provider companies. They have to be, uh, they have to keep their strength, they have to keep their eye on, on last mile connectivity and that type of fiber infra they have to maintain and they have to make and then have, they have to maintain. Digital India movement, because of this, what we have seen in uh, this uh, post pandemic, uh, during this pandemic scenario, because of this digital India movement and this core fiber network only, 
people were able to work very decently who can who could do who could do work from home or as i just mentioned through their ott platform or through other networks they were being entertained entertained or they were doing some other activities also so uh, these people these other people rather uh, msos and isps have to make their network very strong apart from their core infra from telecom where they can reach out to the last mile customers from where they can generate the revenue Fine. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mehta. We have got a lot of questions, almost close to around 40 questions, which need to be addressed. And uh, time has really gone by fast. So I would like to have uh, Mr. Maleshwar, uh, very briefly, if you could uh, give your input so that we can address some of the questions which have keep popping up at the Q&A box. Uh, Mr. Maleshwar, your comments on this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Manoj. See, uh, this Digital India, everyone knows that what is the primary objective of Digital India uh, is to make uh, make the connectivity more efficiently electronically. That's what. So that is that is now improving in India very much, and uh, it is now reached to the even to the village level. So where people can go and uh, uh, book their tickets online and all that, they are, everything is going now e e digital. So that is very much there. So what what is the base for this? So ultimately the fiber infrastructure. So once you say the fiber infrastructure, it needs to be uh, carried up to the home. If you compare to the, the less population countries uh, like Singapore, like Australia and all that, where every, every home is connected with the fiber. So India so need to go to that level, but all the state governments also looking up in this, in, in this fashion. So let us say, uh, for example, this Andhra Pradesh has taken AP fiber grid, Telangana has taken the T fiber, and Tamil Nadu is going to come up with a Tanfi net. Kerala is also going to keep on. That means they know that they want to connect their people to be connected every home to be in a fiber. So where they can provide the triple pay services. That means what they want to get out of that is that money from the customer at the home level in the three parameters, that is voice, data, and video. So it is very clear that recently when cable TV was there is only unidirection. Unidirection means they only send the transmission and they don't look back again. Now, CATV is also now coming with attached broadband services. So they know that we don't survive unless until we provide, we provide data to it. So tomorrow, if Geo provided voice, data, video, and video conferencing and all that, they need to again upgrade it. To it. That means what's happening here is that the fiber infrastructure is being mandatory. And it is, it, is to be, it is to be upgraded, and it is to be provided, and it is to be, uh, we can say that every home must be uh, available with the fiber. So then only a bandwidth provisions are available and the costing can be different based on the customer, but fiber has to reach to every home. So for that, the, all the cable operators who reach to the home, every home, no other person goes to home and collect the money. The cable operators, only the person who can go to the home and collect the money and have a personal relation with them. So there they can provide every home with the fiber and see, I'm going to say that tomorrow, if even IOT comes up and if 5G comes up, no one can disturb because the connectivity what CATV people have with the customer is very strong, very, very strong. So in this scenario, I recommend all the person who is with all the, all the companies, CATV companies of India, should go and expand their fiber network to the home as quickly as possible and improve their connectivity. Then you see the business will definitely come up. So fiber infrastructure is very essential. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malishwar. Uh, Mr. Roos, quickly your comments so we can address some of the questions coming up. Oh, okay. Uh, see, the, with, with the pandemic, what we are in right now, and the digital leap, what India has taken right now, this is the right time for even for the uh, MIB and for the DOT to con reconsider the uh, the issue of India. Uh, as uh, Malaysia said, uh, and uh, it's and Jignesh Bhai, what he said, uh, the cable operators can immediately, uh, you know, move and get internet to the home, and we can straight away hit a hundred million homes without much of a delay. Uh, yeah, there is one challenge, which is the right of way. There are uh, like how the uh, uh, you know road infrastructure and everything is taken. We need a common duck. The right of way is a challenge. Once the right of way issue is resolved, I'm sure okay, we can move fast on this. Uh, uh, maybe a common duck sort of a thing should be worked out. Uh, uh, maybe a, a PPP model, where is the I mean what is a public-private partnership or a block model, where is there is a build, lease, operate, and transfer model. Some sort of a model the uh, the government should work out have one common duct and let everybody pay and get in and uh, you know rather than putting fiber all across the trees and poles 
this can be done and we will have a smart uh, city all across and a, and and a digitally connected home thank you thank you mr roos uh, one issue which has really had an impact uh, on the catv industry is the impact of the ban on chinese goods the indian cable and satellite industry mostly deploys chinese technology now with the government banning chinese products and technologies what will be the impact of this move uh, mr devchand i would first like to have your views sir on this yeah for the cable tv industry what we see for the hardware they are dependent on the chinese products for more than 80% of the hardware products so this is a huge dependence on the chinese products overall if you look at the electronic industry the whole industry more than 60% is dependent on the chinese goods so if there is a total ban on the chinese goods currently for electronics or even for cable tv it's going to paralyze the whole industry if they if the government announce okay we ban totally for all the products it's going to really paralyze the whole industry all the current projects or other things going on will definitely uh, get stalled and take a longer time currently what we will have to do is look for alternatives look for alternative uh, source of uh, uh, this uh, products look for components even the finished goods that uh, are made in india currently the components come from china so the dependence of components finished goods on china is too huge government what they can do currently they have to give us time give the whole industry time to first set up a alternative supply chain solution from other countries or to develop the products in house in india that is what india uh, india government has already been trying to say make in india but there has never been any positive steps or positive incentives to the industry because whenever the made in india goods are coming out the cost cannot match the chinese cost so again it goes back to imports from china or even the raw material comes from china so the government has to first build up the raw material and the component industry in india where the whole infrastructure and the ecosystem is built in india and the production or make in india can be really possible i think it takes it will take around 2 to 3 years time frame for the whole thing to happen and the government has to be really positive to this thing to happen and to really give incentives for the industry to try and make the goods in india and once this is available then they can have us say that okay we can now ban all chinese goods for india before this if it is banned now or it's a total ban is there we will really be paralyzed and the whole industry will go in a paralysis state so overall we have to have a good uh, uh, support from the government for the manufacturing make in india for the raw materials components and everything and we should uh, develop goods or manufacture goods which can compete in price with china so that we can have the world market by china and current ban on china will not affect china it will only affect the indian industry because china has only uh, india export is only 3% of the total china export so it's going to hurt us more and it will not hurt china at all so thank government you. has to give us time for the whole thing thank you very much uh, mr devjan for your views uh, mr mehta if you could uh, briefly tell us your thoughts on this yeah uh, see the government uh, after this uh, 15th 16th june of galwan issue the government and definitely any government will take this type of stand uh, for anti chinese uh, sentiment but uh, very honestly uh, as uh, devchan bhai also said this is very tough task so uh, to replace the chinese products in our industry or in electronics industry rather into pharma industry also rather into automobile ancillary industries also and lots many other industries our indian dependence on china as a gsc global supply chain leader is much much higher it's maybe in the range of between 70 to 90% in different segments where we are depending on them so the we require what first of all the willingness and the very heavy push from goi if government of india pushes our people the industries entrepreneurs manufacturers then only we can do it at the same time we have to develop a very profound skill set but china is having as of now which is as as in just previous question 
there is a uh, skill set development into India for CATV. That is, I am talking for the whole uh, this ever industry also. So this is not even uh, uh, two, three, four years job also. This is this is the task for at least between five to ten years with the dedicated government push. So uh, and this can not only be just a political move. See, this move has to be growth oriented. If it is just to be a just a political move, then uh, after some two, three, four years, if we change the government, if that government is going to be changed, then again the move would be slowed down. So the move has to be very positive aspect with growth orientation. So it can be done, but at the moment it is very tough. And and uh, just uh, I have some thought for this also. We government cannot immediately ban Chinese or this type of uh, uh, this products from China because we are also one of the signing of WTO agreement. So as of now, immediately the banning the, the banning is difficult. But yeah. Entry points where custom clearance and there are different aspects of duty declaration. They may they may make some hassles or may have some hurdles also. But uh, again, uh, this this uh, time is going to take for more than five to ten years with dedicated efforts and pushed by GOI. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Malhotra. Would you like to make a brief comment on this aspect? Manoj, since you say brief, I, I am bursting with stuff while all of the other panelists were talking. But since you say brief, I will just come up with this and say that, you know, uh, I think the term banning uh, would probably be not the right English word to use. I would put it more, well, it's taken us 20, 25 years to come to this degree of dependence on one country for supply of material, primarily because of price is going to take us at least 10 years more if we want to, I would not say ban, but I would say substitute and find, or find alternatives uh, for suppliers for primarily components uh, that go into electronics change, into equipment that is used in the cable and satellite industry. Uh, having said that, I, I have been approached in the past uh, month, month and a half, uh, and you know, that there are manufacturers who have already found viable sources for components and equipment, uh, including motherboards and so on, populated motherboards in Taiwan, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in Japan, which is slightly more expensive. But these other countries provide very cheap and very good alternatives, both in terms of pricing as well as, well as in terms of quality. But at the same time, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. One of the people asked this question, do you think it's really feasible to ban China? And I would again say that we have to think along with the government in terms of a long term to reduce dependence on China rather than ban them. We can't shut down our factories because the components are coming from there. But what we can do is source the components from other countries or other sources and start developing that and for that, the Chambers of Commerce and the Government of India Ministry of Commerce, they have to play a really huge, big role in identifying these countries and these companies uh, across the globe. So banning, uh, I would say not banning, I would say substituting. Uh, that's the way uh, to move uh, forward on that. Look at other countries and alternatives. Perfect. Uh, that's, that's a very Manoj, interesting Manoj, if, I, if I may just add one last yes, thing. Please. Not yes. connected the China thing, but in, you know, uh, a lot of the questions that are popping up here are asking questions about what is the future of the cable TV industry. And, you know, I smile to myself when I hear that question, because I have been hearing that question for the last almost 25, 28 years. Uh, every time something new happens, uh, this question is asked at any of the SCAT workshops or the SCAT uh, sessions, uh, public sessions or the exhibitions that are held as to what is going to happen. Uh, so when cable TV came in, the film industry said, oh my God, the film industry is going to die. Didn't happen. Then VCRs and video cassettes came in and the same question. Both businesses continued. DTH came in, cable TV said, oh my God, cable TV is going to die. Didn't happen. We are still almost six times the size. Cable is still the six times the size of DTH. IPTV came in, same question. Uh, now you're getting OTT platforms. The same question is being asked. The cable industry has survived for over, since 1981, when we started, it has survived for almost 40 years. 
technologies have come, technologies have changed, the cable industry is still there and it will continue to be there. What you as a cable operator have got to do as a, whether you're an MSO or an, a last mile operator, any DPO, what you have to do is keep pace with technology. You are a cable operator, you are providing analog. From analog, you went to digital. From digital now, most MSOs and cable networks are also providing broadband services. So you became an ISP. You kept up with the times and you moved ahead. And those that did not obviously had to shut shop or sell off their business or merge with some other business. Now comes the time with the next challenge of uh, the ODD platforms that you know, the fear is that they are taking over. And yes, in, when, you know, when this lockdown started in the month of April and May, uh, I think the OTT platforms added almost one crore new subscribers just in that four to six week period initially. That's huge. But did the cable industry lose any subscribers? No. You know, you will find a lot of reports of how many new subscribers DTH has added. Those same reports will not tell you how many subscribers DTH has lost. And they will never tell you how many new subscribers cable TV has added. Cable TV has been growing, is growing, and will continue to grow. As a cable operator, as an MSO and an LMO, you have to keep pace with technology. You have to offer triple play. You have to offer additional services. You have to offer uh, value-added services. And believe me, no one can touch you because at the end of the day, you are the face that the customer sees, not the others. You're here to stay, so be reassured. Thanks. Well said, well said, Mr. Malhotra. For the closing comments, now I would like to ask the panelists, how do you foresee the future of CATV industry in the next five to 10 years? Mr. Roos, yeah. your comments? Uh, if, yeah, uh, briefly to add up to what Dr. Sudhirji said, yes, upgrade, immediately upgrade uh, to all my uh, LMO friends, uh, LCO friends, business partners, please upgrade. Uh, you, uh, let's upgrade our network uh, through by fiber up to the home. Uh, one is that collaborate uh, with the best partners you can have immediately. Uh, it can be a, a broadband service provider. Uh, it can be your teleco, uh, teleco service provider. Please collaborate. Partner, cons consolidate. Uh, if you're finding it difficult, please consolidate. And keep innovating. That's the, that's the way forward for the, uh, for the cable opportunity. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Mr. And, and cable, cable is there. Cable, as Sudip Ji said, cable is going to grow. Because there is a 38 odd million of uh, Doodoshan uh, free, uh, you know, GD direct is there. These of these subscribers will, uh, you know, gradually they will upgrade to a pay TV uh, uh, subscriber. So uh, and there, and there are millions of homes which are today cable dark. So these all will keep graduating and uh, we will keep growing. And that's how cable TV had been growing and cable TV is there, and it will keep growing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Uh, quickly, your comments, Mr. Devchan. Yeah, India as a whole country is uh, different from other countries. Like we have big cities, towns, small villages. And when we see the pattern of the people watching cable TV in small towns or villages, there we see it's still they like the cable uh, set-up box or the cable view. They still will not move to OTT immediately. Yeah, in the big cities, we have already seen uh, people moving out to OTT. And even in big cities, it's not moving out, it's uh, not replacing, it's adding on to OTT because there are every homes will have some senior people, some old people who still want the set-up box and the cable TV connection to be there. So overall, the cable TV growth in India has to be there, it will continue for the next five to 10 years. OTT will get added to it, OTT will, some places it will add, some places it will make replace. So over a period of five to seven years, maybe we can see some replacement of uh, cable homes with OTT homes. But overall, the weaving pattern of India, what we see, what we saw even in the lockdown period, uh, when the Ramayana and Mahabharat serial was been aired, they had the maximum viewing compared to any OTT or other platforms. That means India cable TV homes or India TV, cable TV is still there and people still prefer to watch cable TV. So that growth is always going to be there. And as Mr. Roos and Mr. Sudeep said, we, they have to innovate. All cable networks have to innovate. They have added uh, internet ISPs. Uh, they have become ISPs. They have to add more and more uh, value-added services. They will have to add, say, pay-per-views. Sports channels are there. Local channels are there. They'll have to add some good local channels, which will attract more uh, customers, more viewers. So they will have to keep innovating themselves for new services and better services. 
Thank you. And thank the growth you. is always going to be there. Okay, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Devchan. Uh, Mr. Mehta, your views? You're on mute. You're on mute, uh, Mr. Mehta. As my uh, other three earlier panelists just told that uh, Cable TV is going to be there. We are one of the very cheap uh, uh, entertainment in India, approximately 10 rupee uh, per day. One, two, uh, very fantastic uh, last mile services. If you phone at 11 o'clock, if you phone at your cable, then you will get the person to reach it. Very fast and very prompt and efficient and maybe satisfactory services. I am talking very largely. And at the same time, as uh, these people have done, one has to upgrade. They have to collaborate. They have to cooperate. Cut could band karna padega. Sida professionally, malab to be honest, very professionally danda karna padega. And ek dusre ke saath mein bhi because now this is the time again. Pandemic chal raha hai. Everything is there. They have to increase their skill set. Achhe manpower lagane padenge. Unko unko they have to improve their skill set. Then they have to improve their network. They have to invest to their network. But as Mr. Sudeep ji just told. कि भई ये ये प्रश्न जो है वो 40 साल से घूम रहा है जो मेरा 40 साल से आए और ये 25 30 साल से मैं भी सुन रहा हूं कि हाउ मच टाइम दिस गोइंग टू बी सर्वाइव्ड एंड एनी कोई कोई कॉर्पोरेट आ गया अभी कोई दूसरे कोई बड़ा आ गया बट वी आर गोइंग टू बी देयर ओनली थिंग इज दैट यू हैव टू वन हैज टू मेंटेन देयर नेटवर्क आप एफटीटीएच करो यू हैव टू बी जस्ट अ लास्ट माइल कैरियर यू हैव यू आर जस्ट अ फेस ऑफ टू द लास्ट माइल कस्टमर यू हैव टू मेंटेन द रिलेशनशिप by service, by quality, uh, any any other aspects, if if it all that, right? Thank you, uh, Mr. Malveshwar. Your comments, and then we get to some few questions. So thank you again. Uh, this is this a very right question, as Sudeep Malhotraji very clearly explained uh, the the strengths of uh, CATV. It is going to be there hundred percent. There is no doubt. But my fear. Or as cable operators fear, there is there is a fear is there. The competition comes and the customer goes away. Yes, competition will come. Competition will come because the terminal equipment are going to change, or customer need is going to change. People should understand this. So what happens here? Tomorrow, if it goes to 4K, tomorrow it goes to 8K, tomorrow it goes to uh, uh, video gaming, tomorrow it goes to VR VR channelizing, and other other requirements comes to the home whether the cable operator is going to sustain the capabilities of requirements means need is going to increase so are we able to supply the need to the customer then customer is with us so sudhi balwadhi very clearly explained that you you have to change and upgrade your 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 things your technology or your things tomorrow if suddenly a wireless competition comes to you then what you do i i clearly define in the three factors here Coming two years, coming five years, and next then three years means total ten years. First year, two years, you don't have any much effect of any of the competition. Your OLT, when your business still goes on in the way that that sufficiently supports your both uh, TV and cable TV and broadband, people are happy. After two three years, if the wireless competition comes to the picture, maybe you call it as a 5G uh, after NSA. Not talking about NSA. NSA is going to come forward. Taking apart the form of that, if the comes a wireless competition comes to you, then are we ready to beat that technology and beat the things? That time, of course, I am going to tell you that your MS was also going to become a small mini data centers. I am very confident in that. You don't lose your business, don't lose your confidence. Be positive in your way. Upgrade your technology, upgrade your things, upgrade and meet the requirements of the needs. Needs are going to change. Your terminal equipment is going to change. Once the terminal equipment is going to change, your backend system will change. Once your backend system will change, your technology will change. So it's about the reverse path. So once you do the technology a stronger way and follow the guidelines of attend uh, seminars and like this and go to uh, SCAT exhibitions and all that, you will find the latest technologies and upgrading paths. The path will give you the right direction. Don't lose your confidence. You are going to get your own customer with you. You are being connected. You be positive. Just what you need to do is that check, check the competition, check the path. Don't you think things need and don't, don't be panic. Right? Be a planned person, then you definitely be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Manoj, you. Uh, yeah. Manoj, may I just uh, yeah. in summing? Yes. Uh, just before we close, you know, there, there's almost about sixty, sorry, fifty-one or sixty-five 50. questions over there, yeah. and believe me, I've been scrolling through those questions. I'd love to interact and answer and get in 
with the person who's asking those questions, Rointon, Mr. Vinod Kare, uh, the gentleman from Mizoram. I'd yes. love to answer all those questions. I mean, you know, so, my heart so, lies there. No, no. I should point out in closing, however, that one of the biggest threats, and I would use that word, for both DTH and cable TV is indeed the OTT industry. Not because it is better or superior or will be more popular, but purely because while the government steps in and regulates everything that the cable operator, the MSO and the DTH platform does, where the OTT platforms are concerned, there is absolutely zero regulation. They can show whatever they want and get away with it. They can show whichever channels, whatever videos, whichever movies, censored, uncensored, all kinds of stuff and get away with it. The cable operator cannot do that. Even today, the cable operator or the MSO has to follow this archaic law, which is there in the Cable Act of 1995, which says that if a satellite channel transmits something that is not good, the cable operator as the delivery boy gets arrested for that. We are still living under those shadows. The government has got to step in and put in a what we have always called a level playing field. Yeah, that will happen. DTH, that should happen. Whether it's TV and whether it's OTT, it has to be a level playing field. Otherwise, yeah. you're favoring That's one right. against the other. Every broadcaster has set up their own OTT platform and are bypassing the laws by doing that. We need to bring in regulation for that. Uh, so thank you, Sudhir ji, for your insight. Uh, I find that there are 51 questions here. So I have found a way how to tackle these questions. What we will do is we will try and address each of these questions and get the panelists to answer them. Uh, we will have them published in the SCAT magazine and also try and uh, send it out to all the delegates who have registered and uh, make sure that these questions have, are answered. Because yeah. right now we are running short of time. So I don't think it will be proper on my part to just take a couple of questions. So that will be the best way for us to address these questions. And I'm sure in the next edition, we will try and ad address all these questions. Uh, okay. uh, Varun, I would now like to hand it over to you to, for the closing comments. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Hariya, Mr. Mehta, Mr. Roos, Mr. Malhotra, Mr. Maleshwar, and Mr. Madhavan for an extremely insightful session for some great knowledge sharing. I hope all of you enjoyed that. I'm sure our audience also had some interesting takeaways from that as well. Uh, thank you all for logging in today. Follow us on all our social media handles for more updates on the show and our forthcoming webinars. Stay safe and take care. Thank you and have a good evening.